government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put their hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. and gentlemen welcome to logan for liberty how are you all doing i am coming at you from the pacific northwest where the sun shines so bright only to rain just a few hours later i think i already asked how you're all doing on this podcast on this show whatever you want to call it we talk about some basic principles we talk about individualism free markets tolerance peace limited government natural law the scientific method, and decentralization. Um, other things that I talk about are natural law, liberty, objectivism, enlightenment, economics, constitutionalism, peace, and reason. I think I already said peace. That's the general gist of what this show is, what it's about, things that I want to talk about. That is the epistemology of this show that's the paradigm of this show it's pretty one note in that sense um you know my basic worldview in that sense although that doesn't mean that i don't have an interesting perspective on current events that doesn't mean i won't surprise you or sometimes my personal opinion a way i feel about something isn't what guides my political beliefs So, for example, I personally don't smoke marijuana. It's just a personal choice I've made. I've never touched it. I grew up around family members that smoked pot. I've grown up around a lot of my best friends were potheads. And when I say pothead, I mean like, the dude, totally radical, no regrets. You know, R-A-G, regrets. I hung around those type of people and they gave me kind of a bad view on marijuana now i am aware that marijuana isn't dangerous like heroin cocaine even alcohol or tobacco well cigarettes in the sense in like uh the cigarettes that we know like marble like you smoke it inhale the smoke i'm a cigar smoker so i i go out of my way to clarify what i'm talking about when i say tobacco If you want to smoke marijuana, that's fine. I'm not going to judge you harshly for smoking marijuana. It's safe, relatively, compared to other things that are available, especially uh, tobacco, as we know it, and alcohol. It's just a personal choice I've made culturally. Um, I've never... I know there's a lot of people who get violent when they drink or who make terrible decisions when they drink, but I haven't been exposed to that as much as I have been exposed to addicts who are in denial potheads I don't want to make this sound like I'm a social conservative that's like oh we need to ban the marijuanas that's not how I feel it's just I've seen few potheads and I know this isn't representative of all potheads okay I I guess I need to be fair There's a lot of people I know that smoke pot who are extremely intelligent. Let me just be clear. It's just a personal choice I made. I don't need to spend two minutes on pot. I don't care about it, really. My point is, is that I don't allow my personal opinions to shape my political view. I guess a better example would be prostitution. I am socially conservative in the sense that I believe in monogamy and marriage. I believe in pair bonding, the nuclear family. But I will never, ever use the government to coerce you into 
practicing a lifestyle that you don't want to practice. I wish you practiced a lifestyle that I personally believe is the best for society, which is marriage, the nuclear family. But I will never force you to do that type of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I come from, I guess. I kind of went off on a tangent. I digress. Um, in this episode, what I really want to talk about is culture, how to be Marxists, how to be leftists, how to be communists, how to be socialists, how to be postmodernists. And I am aware that postmodernism isn't necessarily left wing. There are postmodernists I like. I especially like Thaddeus Russell. He agrees with us libertarian leaning, objectivist leaning, constitutionalist leaning libertarians, I guess. He, he agrees with us in the sense of individualism. Because he's a postmodernist, which is interesting, he's not a postmodernist as we understand t listening to Jordan Peterson or Stephen Hicks. So he, he's an oddball, in my opinion. And uh, some of the groups that I hang around in, there's postmodernists that are like that. Basically, the truth is subjective, blah, blah, blah. I don't feel like getting into that, really, but I want to talk about how to beat, how to beat big government, how to beat leftism, how to beat socialism. And I think one of the best ways is culture. Uh, Andrew Breitbart is quoted saying that politics is downstream from culture. Basically, culture is gone, but there's a lag. Politics is a lagging indicator of culture. Although sometimes that's not necessarily the case. Because I guess with gay marriage, I think it, we, we hit that pinnacle when gay marriage was legalized. When only 51% of the population agreed that gay marriage was something that was that should be legal or allowed or not banned underneath the, the rule of government. But in the state of Oregon, where I live, which is considered to be a California light state, when you think about it, it's the left coast. When it came to voting on gay marriage, the state that I live in voted against it. And they voted in favor of recreational marijuana. So, I guess that really just goes to show that Democrats or liberals aren't as socially liberal as you think. A lot of them have what Thaddeus Russell, the postmodernist I would talk about, have that Puritan worldview. I have some sort of, yeah, okay, that's going off on a tangent. I'm sorry. This is a really unfocused episode. I guess what I really want to talk about is the Movies Mean Something series. I did a video called Movies Mean Something, and then I did a video called uh, Star Wars is More Conservative Than You Think. I figured the Star Wars video was most appropriate, especially since Star Wars is a huge cultural thing. Star Wars is one of those things that just for some reason... It transcends, transcends space and time. Star Wars is, has existed throughout the generations, throughout the decades. It doesn't matter who you are. I guarantee almost everybody knows who Star Wars is. And every single generation, every single decade, every single grouping of five years, everybody alive today has access to Star Wars content that was created for their time. So everybody knows who Star Wars is, and with the controversy of Star Wars Episode Eight, for some of you um, non-nerds, Star Wars Episode Eight was very divisive among Star Wars fans. So for some of you who aren't nerds, it's a big cultural issue in media, especially in the geekosphere, where I belong personally. So I decided, all right, I'm going to make a video talking about that. And the movies mean something. This idea comes from a video that I have scheduled for October 18th, which is called Pure Evil. It's looking at John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween. Well, more importantly, it's looking at 
the antagonist in that film, Michael Myers. I thought it was appropriate to make that video and schedule it for October 18th, around, I think, a day before Halloween 2018 comes out, the newest Halloween movie coming out, the direct sequel to John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween film. And that was before, I made that back in June, so this was before I even thought about doing a series called Movies Mean Something. And, but in the back of my mind, I've always had this idea planted in my head, because I've been listening to Jordan Peterson a lot, and he has a series of lectures about the psychological significance of the Bible. And he's given this lecture, almost like a college lecture, but I think he's renting out a venue and he's talking about it. And I found it interesting. And if you know who Jordan Peterson is, I'm not talking about um, what he claims intellectually, uh, psychologically, like the science of everything he's talking about. I'm talking about his breakdown of literature, of media, of stories, of the human condition. That's what I'm talking about. He's, he breaks down old Disney movies. Some people like to rake them over the coals and make fun of them for this for some reason. I think it's silly because movies mean something. Movies shape culture or culture reacts to certain movies. Because not, not all movies age well, but well-written movies, despite the quality of how it's made, because newer movies are made higher quality some than older movies. The, the effects are better if a director knows how to have a perfect ratio of CGI, practical effects, or just real world environment. Anyway, I, I seem to be getting off topic a lot. That's what I do. Bear with me. He goes over the psychological significance of it. He breaks it down. He breaks down these stories. He breaks down Pinocchio. He breaks down the Holy Bible. He breaks down all these stories. He's a big fan of Carl Jung, Carl Jung, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, and uh, who else? I can't remember. It doesn't matter though. Um, he's he's a big fan of the Gulag Archipelago and all that, and he he breaks down stories and applies them. They relate to human nature somehow and the idea really clicked with me when I was listening I don't know if it was part one the introduction to his psychological significance of the bib biblical stories or if it was the first part past the introduction and he's talking about and he, he I think he talks about it on the H3 podcast with Ethan and Hila, Hila Klein I think that's her name I can't remember for some reason I'm having brain farts. It, I always have brain farts when I'm trying to do a podcast. And then I can't make any points. And I didn't really write any notes coming into this. I just felt like I would press record and start talking into a microphone. And upload it as a podcast. But anyway, he talks about Adam and Eve and that story. And how when the snake pops in, it's almost like you have a gated community. Where... It's nothing but order. And this is sort of a yin and yang story. And then the snake pops his head in. And that's basically a metaphor for yin and yang. Because on the light side of the yin and yang, on, in, in order, there's a little bit of chaos in it. But on the chaos side, there's a little bit of order in it, right? So this snake is representative of chaos in order. But that's also... that. As a philosophical point, it's relatable to almost every aspect of any culture you can think of, of any instance you can think of that humans go through. So you can take it how the story is read literally, you can take it that way. Yeah, this snake is this snake is chaos in a society of order. But you can transcend that and let's take it to politics. So Donald Trump's wall. Donald Trump is attempting to set up a wall on the southern border. 
He's trying to create order and preserve order. And this isn't regarding whether or not you agree with the wall, because I personally don't. This is just a parallel that I am drawing. So we know that while, while Mexicans, or not Mexicans in general, but South American immigrants, they're not the, they don't make up the majority of the United States immigrants. But they are the single biggest block of immigrants, which is why that is the focus. So there's a general concern about that being chaos, because here's our society, what we deem as homogenous, whether it be culturally or by skin color even, and we're trying to preserve things because this is chaotic. People coming through, flooding the southern border is chaotic. Especially ones that maybe takes, take up welfare programs. They use more resources than they actually help provide. They help produce. So thinking about that, that's Adam and Eve, right? And Donald Trump is trying to create a situation of, of order. So think about it in this way. How does that apply to Donald Trump's wall? Well, let's just get this out of the way. Out of the, way. the race element, which is the card that the Democrats like to play, and certainly in some aspects there is a bit of a race element because they seem to be more focused on the Southern immigrants, and I explained why they would focus on the Southern immigrants other than race. So I don't necessarily agree that it's about race, but I think there is a certain aspect with some of them where it's about race. You know, white people, who are the majority in the country, they, especially in maybe more rural or homogenous cultures within the United States, they look around and they see their demographics changing, and that's scary to them. Whether or not that's positive or negative, it's still scary to them. And I don't know if I agree with them, but I definitely empathize with them. I'm not all right by any means. I don't think we need the force of government to keep colored people out. But yeah, that's that that's worrying to them. That's their order shifting into chaos. That that's a little bit of chaos in the order that they see it. So now let's talk about it in uh aspects of our life outside of politics. Let's say you have a house. Right? And then all of a sudden your house catches on fire. But your house was order. Your house was shelter. Your house was fine. Chaos. Done. That's what Adam and Eve is and the snake. Now, take with that whatever you will, but that's what inspired me to make this series movies mean something. And I plan on breaking down more movies as I go along. I plan on doing another one about Star Wars, but I just felt like I needed to make a Star Wars one because Star Wars is more conservative than you think. But in my introduction to the Movies Mean Something series, not, not the Movies Mean Something introduction, but the first technical or the first labeled Movies Mean Something video, I break down movies into three different parts. Propaganda pictures, popcorn pictures, and art. Now, art is subjective. Anything you look at can be art. And that's something that postmodernists argue, and I think that's something that most people agree with. Of course, so you could look at a toilet, right? Is that art? Well, I mean, yeah, it's art, especially if you're sculpting it yourself out of clay or however ceramic works. Technically, that could be considered art, but it's not something I would say that most people would consider art because we see it so often, right? And we see movies so often, but it's not every time that you see a movie that just blows you away. So I used a more narrow definition of art. I didn't know what else to call it, so I said, okay, art, because art, in my opinion, is something that transcends culture. Or, or maybe it, it it applies to a certain culture, but on a broad sense of the culture. Because you can have a culture, and then you could have subsects within the culture. Like, there's American culture, but what is American culture? 
It's the fact that it's a melting pot and the fact that we're pretty right wing compared to the rest of Europe. Even Democrats are white right wing compared to Europeans. That's just a fact. Um, so with that being said, in my opinion, art, movies that are art, are films, so Star Wars in this case, that transcend politics. They transcend culture. It has a message. It can make you think, right? But not everybody will get the same answer. It can make you think, and it can influence their thoughts, but not everybody else, not everybody's going to come out of that film thinking the same thing. Now, a, a movie that is art isn't made entirely to make you walk out thinking a certain way, but maybe it's walk making you walk out thinking about something. Even if it's a specific theme they're making you think about, they're not telling you how to think about that theme. But maybe that was the intention, but it didn't come off that way. And I talk about how Star Wars is one of those films. And to me, a movie that is art is a movie where the product takes precedence over the propaganda in it. It's a film that is crafted to be good, crafted to be perfect, crafted to work, crafted to be coherent, more so than it is to say, hey... This is how you should think on a specific issue, which brings us to popcorn pictures as I define them with a popcorn picture. That's a movie that is made to persuade you on a specific topic. Every single plot point, every single character decision goes to serve the plot, which is serving an ideology, an agenda, or a specific theme in general. So this will bring us over to popcorn pictures. What are popcorn pictures? Well, think of Transformers, the movies that have come out recently. Think of 2012, that movie with John Cusack. Now, 2012 is actually perfect in this sense because not only is it a popcorn picture, there's a little bit of propaganda sprinkled. A movie can fit in all three categories. It's sort of like a Venn diagram where you draw circles. So there's movies maybe that are only art, that are only propaganda pictures, that are that are only popcorn flicks, popcorn pictures. And then there's movies that maybe line up in more than one category. They line up in this and that category. Just two, maybe. And this is where 2012 is, in my opinion. 2012 is a popcorn flick and... It's a propaganda flick. It's a popcorn flick because it's about the end of the world. It was based on that scare that people thought that the world was going to end on 2012. It was this irrational fear, despite the fact that there was really... It had to do with the Mayan calendar, right? Never mind the fact that the Mayans didn't get a chance to create another calendar. Because where are the Mayans now? We just have descendants of Mayans. People had this irrational fear that 2012 was going to be the end of the world. So they made the movie 2012 to capitalize off of people's irrational fear. I wasn't a believer in 2012. I was a sophomore when that date... I was a sophomore in high school when that date came and then passed like any other day. But I still enjoyed the movie 2012. Uh, was it my 7th grade or 8th grade year when it came out? I thought it was a pretty good film. It was fun, and it was definitely a popcorn flick. It played off of the culture that was there at the time. It had special effects. Shit was blown up. It was basically mindless entertainment. But there was a little bit of propaganda towards the end, because why? The rich, the powerful, the important were buying their way onto these arcs to survive. The peasants, the poor, they didn't get to survive. They didn't get to live, but the rich did, which was definitely a sort of left-wing narrative, I suppose. Well, I mean, I guess in that sense that can transcend even right-wing politics, but for the most part, that's more of a left-wing thing. The rich don't care about the poor, and maybe they don't. I'm not arguing that, but 
that was a little bit of propaganda within that film. But it was still mostly a popcorn picture because the entire flick was about that one. Uh, it, it was about shit blowing up. They did have a moment where one of the rich people that they made you not like in that flick ended up dying. It was, you know, it was the Monopoly guy, but fat, you know, this big old gut, kind of an asshole, disregards everybody but himself. As if that's really, a, yeah, okay, I won't get into that, I'm sorry. Um, he ended up dying, I think his kids were fat, and I think they died too, or they lived, I'm not sure, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, I'll have to watch it again, because it was a fun movie to watch. And I, again, I talk about Star Wars, and how that, in my opinion, that film is art, but it also perfectly goes into propaganda, and popcorn flicks because you watch Star Wars and you're like, cool, spaceships, oh, lightsaber, lasers, alien planets, right? And there's a bit of political allegory, social commentary in it. But what makes it art is that even though George Lucas, the guy who made the original trilogy as we know, even though he was left wing, he has his political ideology. And he definitely put that into Star Wars, but because of the product that he made, it transcended left-wing audiences and went straight to right-wing audiences too. It was a universal thing. And that's what I talk about in my movies mean something. So just to recap earlier, the video that I made about John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween, which will be scheduled on, which, which is scheduled for October 18th, a day before the new Halloween movie comes out. It talks about Michael Myers and how he's, I won't spoil it, but it's called Pure Evil. You could probably guess what I was going to say. And I broke, I broke down the character of Michael Myers and said, all right, this is what it is, both intentionally and unintentionally by John Carpenter. But I think for the most part, it was intentionally. If I made the video now, I would probably break it down to how it become, how it's art, how it's a little bit of propaganda, cultural propaganda, and how it's also a popcorn flick because it's a slasher movie. I would probably break that down. So I had I made that video, and then Jordan Peterson's psychological significance lecture of the biblical stories inspired me to make movies mean something, and this is why I think it's important how this plays into culture because you see there's the one extreme of how media affects the way we act and the way we think so you have those people that will blame mass shootings on video games or how they make kids violent kids will grow up violent that's the extreme end of things and then the other extreme is to say, yeah, no, movies don't have any effect on the culture at all. They kind of do. Now, there, there, there's no evidence to suggest that they completely change your life decision, but you still take lessons out of these things. So I found that interesting. Hollywood nowadays is pretty left-wing. There's a few people that stand out, like Clint Eastwood was more right-wing, and his movie, Grand Torino, kind of shows he's, uh, in the movie, uh, Walt is a veteran. He owns firearms. He's kind of, uh, he, he sees his demographics around him changing, and he's kind of worried about that. Uh, another good example is 28 Days Later, because the social commentary behind it is about germ and disease, but it... On the surface, it seems like almost like a zombie flick. Technically, the, the infected in that movie aren't zombies. But they're, it's a play on the genre. Th that movie, while it seems like a basic just zombie flick, it transcends that because, well, it's art. So it, it appeals to a massive amount of people. And the propaganda side of it is a warning about disease, viruses, outbreaks and that type of stuff but what's great about it is is they they shove it down your throat in the beginning kind of the message there's a little bit of an animal rights 
message in it too in the beginning. But it doesn't bother you because it fits the story. Now, I know if you've gotten this far into this episode, this podcast, if you're still listening, I've kind of, I've kind of rambled on and haven't really made any coherent points, I guess. But this is me just speaking my mind. I should have put that warning beforehand. This is me just just really going through my ideas and trying to form them to make points that'll serve this channel's best interests. So 28 Days Later, great movie. Seems like a zombie flick, has social commentary, is a popcorn picture, is art. And then you have this sequel to that movie, which is kind of amazing because it shifts the social commentary from a warning about disease and germ, about microscopic biological threats, and it kind of shifts the social commentary over into maybe what we consider, what we can consider an authoritarian human threat, military uh, domination, imperialism. In a way, but it's not saying, hey, the government's imperialistic or this country is imperialistic. It's done in a clever way. And let me spoil it for you because uh, I, it's not really a spoiler. It happens in the first 30 minutes of the film. But it, this 28 months later takes place after the initial outbreak that we've seen 28 days later. We have no idea where the 28 days later characters are. Because it shifts the perspective of the story. Basically, for the most part, the United Kingdom, the main island is infection free. So they start, the American government is starting to repopulate Great Britain with British people. And for the most part, um, their housing is in a hotel or this apartment skyscraper building. I don't know if it's a a hotel or an apartment building, it doesn't really matter, but this is where they're to live, there's a pub, it's sort of military order, that's the government, that's the hierarchy, is the United States military reestablishing this country, so for the most part, they're under martial law, and eventually, obviously, because it's sequel to 28 Days Later, an outbreak happens, and it gets to the point, because there's a bunch of security, right? You would expect there to be a bunch of security just in case something happens. That's their version of police. The snipers are on top of the rooftops. The infected are just taking over, but it's nighttime. And because the infected in this, in 28 days later and 28 months later, aren't rotting zombies. They're human beings who are still alive. They are just infected with rage. They are angry, so they just want to kill you. So they're not rotted. The, the only indicators, maybe, is that they act violent, their eyes are red, but you're looking through scopes, and they're not looking, these infected aren't looking up at you, they're looking at other people, but because there's so much chaos going on around, you have no idea who's who. Everybody's chaotic. Everybody is displaying mannerisms of rage, of craziness, of chaos. So there's a scene, a part, where they say, okay, code red. We failed the mission. Kill everything. So you get this really intense scene of these snipers just killing everything from infected to humans because you can't tell the difference. And you get this really interesting sort of subplot because one of the snipers is struggling killing people. He does it and his story kind of progresses later on. I won't spoil that part for you if you haven't seen it. I think that'll be the next movies that I talk about because it's such a good movie in my, my opinion. The 28 Days Later duo, duology, is that what you call it? Du, duology? Like a trilogy? A duology? I need to look up that film. A duo? Was that what I just say duo? Is that what I would say? Yeah, but there is, what was I talking about? Yeah, it's about military, imperial, imperialism, martial law, invasion, uh, militarization of our police, stuff like that. That's what it was about, but it wasn't, 
down your throat because in the context, it's like it doesn't feel like propaganda. Which, in my opinion, is what makes it art. But it's also a popcorn flick. But there's a bit of social commentary in it. And I think a great example of a movie doing this also is The Crazies. I'm just naming, like, zombie genre-esque movies. George A. Romero's The Crazies, it's old, low-budget, but it had social commentary. It was about Vietnam. and But you didn't know... Like, it wouldn't have clicked with you that, oh, this is a anti-Vietnam film unless you personally somehow drew the connection. You came out of that film thinking, oh, I'm anti-war now. But it doesn't tell you to be anti-war unless you were told by a critic, by a left-wing critic or another left-wing person, yeah, this is an allegory for Vietnam. What other movies? Grand Torino is a good one. I think I talked about Grand Torino. Anyway, my point is, is that media does shape the way we think. Media doesn't make us act out something. It doesn't make us violent. But it can help shape our morals. And sometimes us as a culture shapes the movies that we see. There's sort of a, it's a yin and yang. And it goes together. And I think one of the best ways that right-wing, right-leaning people can take over and win the culture is by taking over media. You know, I'd like to see more people like Clint Eastwood in there, more people like Vince Vaughn, Gary Oldman. And those are all radically different people, Vince Vaughn and Clint Eastwood. Well, Vince Vaughn, yeah, Vince Vaughn and Clint Eastwood lean towards more libertarianism, while Gary Oldman is more of a conservative. Is it Gary Oldman? He played um in Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, which is a move which is a series of movies I'm gonna go over. Uh he plays as uh, Commissioner Gordon and in the film The Darkest Hour he plays as Winston Churchill. So it's that guy, the British actor. But we also have somebody like Mark Pellegrino who plays Lucifer on the TV show Supernatural, and he was in the short, was it A&E or ABC series, uh, The Returned. He's an objectivist, you know, from that, he, he's associated with Yaron Brook, Rukka Rukka Ali, he's an Ayn Rand Institute type of person, objectivism, which is, if we're being honest, that's right wing. That's just Hollywood. We could talk about, uh, what's his name? Phil from the rock band All That Remains. We have Eric July in his group called Backwards, and they don't shy away from talking about politics at all. They are anarcho-capitalists, which is also a right-wing sort of uh, uh, philosophy. Phil from All That Remains, I didn't specify, but he's a libertarian. I don't know if he's where he would fall into the objectivist, minarchist, anarcho-capitalist, constitutionalist, uh, I guess categories. I don't know where he falls, but he's libertarian, anti-war, anti, well, not anti-war, anti-interventionism and all that stuff. Where well, I mean, you have all of country music. That's basically a conservative. But that's more of like a nationalist conservative type of movement. But these are the best ways, I think, that we influence people. Not by making movies that are propaganda. Saying, hey, this is why... Not, not Dinesh D'Souza, um, Hillary's America type of movies. But movies that make people think. From a conservative, libertarian, constitutionalist individualist, objectivist perspective that forces people to reason with themselves. See, the art, if you focus, if you, if you have your ideology, but you focus on the art aspect and you focus on the popcorn af- aspect, meaning you make the movie mean something to multiples of people, you want it to speak to as many people as possible, You want it to be entertaining. You want people to enjoy it. Eat some popcorn. Go see it. Buy some fucking soda. Watch your movie. Listen to your music. Read your book. Right? But you don't want to... 
and alone, you don't need to force propaganda into it. Because it'll work as a piece of propaganda on its own without repulsing many people. And I think that's why Star Wars works. I don't know if I've even made a point throughout this entire movie. I guess, like I said, this was just me collecting my thoughts, if anything. Um, I'll probably have some videos talking about this specific topic because I think it's an interesting conversation to have. I haven't really written down or thought through maybe the, my conclusions, the solutions to my conclusions. There's not really an ordered or structured way I'm thinking about this. I can talk to you about Star Wars and how I think that's a perfect film and I could break through the structure of it through the top of my head. And I probably will do that as in addition to my Star Wars is more conservative than you think, which is the, technically the first labeled movies mean something video. So, I don't know, just look forward to more videos if you stuck through this podcast, this episode. Thank you for listening. Let me know in the comment section below, what are movies that connected with you on a deep and personal level? Are there any movies that influenced your political beliefs that led you to, you know, to be more right-leaning? And when I say right-leaning, I don't mean Donald Trump, Mike Pence, right-wing-leaning. I mean, Ron Paul. Vince Vaughn, Clint Eastwood, Tom Woods, Mark Pellegrino, Ian Rand, Murray Rothbard, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, Justin Amash. Those types of people I'm talking about. Is there anything, maybe maybe even a video game or a book that you read that wasn't propaganda, but it, the way it was crafted made you look at things and go, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. And it brought you closer to libertarianism, constitutionalism, individualism, anarcho-capitalism, objectivism, any one of those right-wing free market individualist ideologies, classical liberalism. For me personally, movies that influenced me to think that way are were Star Wars, the original, well, the original and the prequel trilogy, Gran Torino, Black Hawk Down, the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, the James Cameron and Ridley Scott's Alien and Aliens. Those films really influenced my politics. Unintentionally, too. I wasn't, like, going into this film, these films going, oh, yeah, I'm gonna come out political. Um, the original Halloween movie, John Carpenter's 1978. Uh, the movie Warrior with, uh, what's his name? It has Tom Hardy and, I can't remember his name, the guy who plays the brother of Tom Hardy. Uh, Interstellar. Terminator 1 and 2, believe it or not, actually influenced the way I think. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Children of Men. Uh, most recently A Quiet Place. The story of Superman, especially as told in Man of Steel. Um, Night of the Living Dead. These are all movies that have... Oh, in the X-Men series. These are all movies that have influenced the way I think. They didn't tell... I, I didn't come up with my political philosophy through these movies. Don't be confused. That's not how I designed my politics. But they definitely... Thinking about the message that these movies were saying definitely helped me. If I had to name my influences that made me think the way I do... I had a socialist teacher in high school. I'm not a socialist, so don't don't get it twisted. Ron Paul definitely helped lead me towards my beliefs. And then, of course, my own personal life. So that was it for this episode of Logan for Liberty. I hope you're all having a good day. I hope you enjoyed my sort of ram ranting, rambling, non-coherent podcast <laughs> um i hope you all have a good day and uh i hope you all think about maybe what i said uh definitely let me know in the comment section below about things that have influenced your life and your beliefs have a good one